Good afternoon. Welcome to Midcap Radar. I'm Sonal Bhutra. With me is Vivek Iyer. Well, what to say about the markets today? It's a one-way rally. We've come up from the highs, but of course, there's a lot happening in the broader space as well. So we'll discuss that and a lot more. You're absolutely right. You know, it's been a rally like none that we've seen in the show so far. It's been quite spectacular, especially in terms of how the broader end of the markets are performing. Now, you know, actually what's happened is uh, a lot of the power stocks, the utility names, the oil and gas stocks, these are the ones that are doing very, very well in today's trading uh, session and that's what's actually doing quite well. But, uh, you know, this is a special segment. This is Midcap Radar and this is a special segment Midcap Movers. Hormaz is at the wall. Hormaz, uh, quite a lot to choose from. What do you describe a day like this? There you run out of adjectives, right? To describe a move that we are seeing in the broader markets, the benchmark indices, everything that you see is in the green. And you pull up the gainers as well there, IDBI Bank, Godrich Properties, LIC Housings. IDBI Bank is, of course, because of a use break that has happened over its potential disinvestment there. And CG Power, real estate as a sector is doing very well as well. So prestige estates as well. But the day, uh, of course, belongs to the PSU names. And those are the ones that are rocking in today's trading session, if I can call it that, REC, PFC, Gale, HPCL, every constituent of the PSU index is trading with solid gains. REC and PFC both are at a record high as well in today's trading session and HPCL is also nearing its own record high. Some of the other stocks that are doing well in today's trading session, they include the likes of the Adani Group stocks, Adani Total Gas, Adani Wilmar, Green Energy Solutions, all group stocks doing well. The group market cap also touched 20 lakh crores in today's session. So good going for Adani Group stocks as well. No, it's almost blasphemous to talk about losers, but there are some in in today's trading session, so we'll highlight those for you as well. And some of the losers in the uh, in the broader markets, they include the likes of uh, Fortis Healthcare, IPCA Labs, Global Health, and G Shipping. Seeing losses of anywhere between two to three percent. Back to you guys. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for joining us, Armas, with that list. Uh, we now let's do one thing. We'll now get your conversation from the sidelines of Bofa Securities India Conference 2024. My my colleague Nigel spoke with Kaku Nakate, the president of India Country Head at Bank of America, from the sidelines of their India Conference 2024 to discuss their strategy for India. India is very well placed mm -hmm. to become the third largest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. I think elections was an event where many of the people were really focused upon. As you saw that the FI flows in the start of the year to now has you know, actually been outflows yes. because money has gone back to probably lower valued markets because our valuations are at historic high. Yes. Having said that, I think with the event of elections getting complete very soon, and if we were to believe the exit poll, which I do, I think we will have continuity of the government. There aren't many countries across the world and the geopolitics and also being in our favor that the growth of the Indian economy can be relentless. And I strongly believe that this century is for India. So with that, I would say I do expect FPI flows to or come back to India. Mm -hmm. FDI flows also, you know, I think in the next uh, five years yeah. will be much, much faster. If I were to give you a statistics that the last 10 years, actually FDI flows actually went up to 596 billion, mm -hmm. which is double of the previous decade. I feel that in the next five years, we'll have 500 billion. All right. And so that's why I'm very bullish, both on FDI FI and of course the domestic flows continue with SIPs totaling 2.4 billion in just April itself. Indeed, and uh, you know the Indian investor has matured over the years with those uh, SIPs. You know, just a few years ago it was barely 3,000 crores, or now it's at around 20,000 crores, more than two two and a half billion dollars, which is phenomenal. But you know the brief point you made on FI or the FPI flows, FDI, yes, we're expecting you know a big uh, bazooka on those flows. But the FI flows, there have been net sellers year to date, I think roughly around two and a half to three billion approximately. In 2014, 2019, they were actually net buyers getting into the event. Do you expect that to turn around? And do you think that the FIs are waiting on the sidelines, waiting for the selection verdict? And that's why, particularly in the last 45 days or so, they were selling out a little bit more in the Indian markets. So, you know, I would say that India outflows is not alone. It's emerging, emerging market markets market outflows. And, you know, if you go back to the history, mm -hmm. as and when Fed has increased their rates. Yeah. 
emerging markets have seen outflows. So, you know, also the profits that most of the funds have got in India mm -hmm. has been multifold with our valuations being high at yeah. 23x. So in the last few months, as we discussed, funds have gone back within emerging markets to China. Yes. Even though our MSCI weightage is at 18 Indeed. versus what it used to be at 8% in 2020. To your point, I firmly believe that, you know, people did not know because if you see this is if Prime Minister Modi comes back, he will be the only Prime Minister like Jawaharlal Nehru who will come back for the third year yes. in a term. And, you know, there were a lot of ifs and buts in FPI mines yeah. and there was some profit booking as a result because A, they looked good. I see then they were seeing outflows, then you book profits where you're making money. Yes. And second, you're well placed in case anything happened, you know, post any event. So I do feel that flows will come back. It may come back with the results, but we also have to do a bit and continue with reforms in line with what we have been doing. Because one thing I wanted to tell you, Nigel, you know, while everything looks good, actually, Post-COVID, if you really look at it, yes. you know, you saw an increase in revenue. Then the next year, if you see in the fiscal, you saw increase in revenue, but actually margin expansion that took place True. because of deleveraging of balance sheets. And now if you see the last two, three quarters, actually expenses have gone up and margins are slightly squeezed while revenues are continuing robust. Mm. So this is an anomaly with new reforms, with new growth, you know, we should be able to tackle and that will bring back a super growth. Well, uh, you know, that's an interesting point you made uh, with regard to the domestic flows because the domestic money believe that uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will come back for the third term. The FIs are a little bit skeptical. They're yeah. shorting the index futures. They were selling in the cash market uh, as well. And that could turn around and that's what could take the markets high even from these valuations of 21, 22 times odd. But let's focus on, uh, you know, the point that you were making on valuations. There are some of these MNCs that are listed here in India. And the valuations that they're getting here is at a premium actually in comparison to their so-called home country. And they've been taking some money off the table. How do you see that pan out? You know, I understand that there could be a few more large deals that could happen on those lines itself. That is, the parent taking some money off the listed company here in India. Your take. I fully agree with you, Nigel. It also makes, gives me big pride because every time, you know, many years back, when I used to be on roadshows, meeting corporates, they used to always tell me that, you know, we are keeping on investment, you know, investing in India. When will I get the results? Yeah. Now, if you really see, the subsidiaries in India are at much higher valuations and there are more buyouts possible mm -hmm. going forward there are more you know people wanting to really sell stakes yeah. that are possible you saw bat and timkin yeah. for example Indeed. many more coming in but i also see a trend that big companies like we have heard the plans in the market like hyundai going public so there are a lot of people who are looking at subsidiaries to enhance their parent valuations by monetizing their stake. The stake could be to take back money home, but it's also many of them are looking to raise stake to push that money back into India for bigger growth opportunities. Well, uh, that was a very interesting conversation, but let's now slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll speak to Harshwardhan Dole from IFL to discuss the recent trends from the power as well as, as, well as the oil and gas sector. Welcome back. You're still tuned in to Midcap Radar on CNBC TV 18. We'll have a conversation with Mr. Dole in just a bit. But first up, let's focus on Moltec packaging. Their quarter four results were impacted due to lower demand from paints industry. Revenue declined while profit was also impacted on a YOY basis in quarter four. However, they did see a volume growth of around 4.5% in the year gone by. To discuss more on their quarter four performance in the business outlook, Janu Mahanti Lakshman Rao, the chairman and managing director at the company, is joining us now. Mr. Rao, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, you have given a volume growth guidance of 15% in FI25. 
Can you give us a split of how much of it will come in from newer capacities or newer businesses in the paint segment and how much will be from the existing business? See, as you all know that uh, ABG has uh, given us three locations to set up a uh, package in partnership. And we have already started commercial production at uh, Chayar and Panipat. Last two months, supplies have started and the numbers are picking up pace. So, assuming at least we do around 2,500 tons of uh, business with them, which they projected to be 4,000 tons for this annum, that is 24-25. Uh, even we do 2,500 to 3,000, it contributes to almost 8 to 9% of our growth uh, based on our 35,000 tons we have uh, produced last year. So that itself will contribute 8 to 9%. And our uh, square packs and food and FMCG are still growing at a good pace. Uh, the overall uh, food and uh, QPAX growth is 34% last year. So even if we achieve around 20 25%, that will be indirectly a contribution of about 5%. And coming to our new pharma division, which has gone into production, I'm very happy the kind of response we are getting from industry leaders in pharma. Uh, many products are under development, testing, and stability testing also has been taken up by at least five clients. And these numbers will gradually add because they take a little longer time for giving us the commercial clearance. However, from the third quarter onwards, I anticipate the uh, uh, pharma uh, facility also to contribute to the numbers. Probably it may be only 3 to 4% this year. So overall put together, we are confident we'll be reaching at least a 15% volume growth as against 4.8% we achieved last year. Okay, so Mr. Rao, thank you so much for that. So Q3 onwards, we expect the pharma segment revenues to start kicking in. Now, the next question is uh, the guidance that you've given the street as far as the EBITDA per GACI is concerned. You've given a guidance of close to rupees uh, 40 for FY25. What is the trend that you're witnessing as far as raw material prices are concerned? And, uh, you know, why do you expect to see an improvement in the margin? It was close to 39.1 rupees per kg as at the end of Q4. Yes, uh, the one of the reasons why we also noticed uh, paint uh, sales dropping in this year is we are consciously letting go some of the lower value add products in the paint uh, paint business especially, uh, and we are consciously improving our sale in uh, food and FMCG and then followed by pharma. So that is visible in the fourth quarter. If you notice, there is a sharp drop of more than ten percent in uh, paint sales, and there is a big jump in. Uh, square pack, that is our Q pack uh, products. So this is where our better value addition will be keep coming in. And going forward, Pharma will be adding almost double our average or better than double our average EBITDA. Mm -hmm. Even if it contributes 3 to 5% this year, that will be a significant growth. And that's why we are confident we'll be crossing 40 rupees EBITDA per kg. Mr. Rao, I wanted to understand, uh, you said uh, that pharma will be more than double the average EBITDA per kg that you have. So the last known number was around 100 rupees per kg just from the pharma business in terms of EBITDA. When will the pharma business start contributing fully? First up, how much will it contribute in FY25? And once the capacity utilization is at optimum levels, how much will it contribute in terms of, say, volumes and also in terms of revenues? See, this year we are uh, projecting a revenue of about 18 to 20 crores per annum for this year because uh, it will take almost three to five months for some of our products to get stability tested. But our EV tubes already started picking up sale in the month of April and May. We have seen some decent numbers. And uh, the real big numbers in the pharma segment in uh, bottles and caps and canisters will be starting sometime from August onwards. So we are still hopeful to reach anything between say 16 to 20 crores for this year, but next year that should more than double to the region of around 35 to 40 crores. That will be a sizable addition at that time. And going by the traction, what we have created from some of the leading pharma companies, I even anticipate some further growth in capacities may be required. Uh, however, that call we will take in the second half of the current year, uh, so that you know we'll be ready when the uh, demand increases from our clients. Uh, just a clarification here, Mr. Rao, 18 to 20 crore rupees will be per month in the second half or will it be for the entire year? No, no, for the full year. 18 for the to full 20 year it'll be yeah. okay. And next year it should be reason of uh, around 40 crores. Uh, that is the current capacities what we set up, but the capacity also have to be re-looked 
because of the excellent traction we are getting for our products. But anyway, that uh, review we will take after uh, one or two quarters. Okay, sir. Uh, you know, Mr. Rao, you know, we also want to get a sense of the thin packs segment. Uh, we want to understand, you know, whether there was any delay as far as production for both Kisan Jam as well as Horlicks was concerned. Any delay there? And when do you expect that to get commission? Also, give us a sense of the Daman plant. You know, has there been any delays over there? Yeah, the Kisan and the Horlicks products have started production only from April, May this year. Uh, in, in fact, in May, the numbers have really gone up reasonably. So there was considerable delay in launching those products due to various reasons. But now everything is through and uh, the supplies have started. Uh, one more thing is we are now going all out with the Panipat plant for our Tinwal products to cater to the North market. The Aman project is on the back wheel now because uh, more of North demand is what we want to first focus upon. And that project will be ready to go on stream by July, August. So that will be adding to the uh, festival season uh, sweet boxes, uh, food product uh, packaging will start in a, a decent way from July, August in Panipat. So that project will be fully utilized uh, during the next uh, summer season for ice creams and uh, dairy products also uh, from starting from August. But they pick up speed in the next busy season. So okay. growth will be coming more from the North plant. Okay, all right, Mr. Rao. So a lot of capacity is coming up, a lot of new businesses that will start contributing as well. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Rao, for joining us today and giving us a sense of how the business is panning out. So pains did not do so well in quarter four, but they expect uh, the Aditya Birla group to contribute uh, heavily to the volume growth in FY25. We'll slip into a short break. As promised, on the other side, we'll speak to Harshvar Dandole from IFL Securities to discuss the recent trends from both the power and oil and gas space. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Midcap Radar. No, two specific sectors that are doing very well in the session today are oil and gas as well as power utility companies, which are the big gainers today. HPCL and BPCL, in fact, have surged close to 10% today. Will this outperformance continue? We are joined by Harshwar Dandole, the Senior Vice President of Institutional Equities at IIFL, uh, with his particular call on the oil and gas space. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Dole. Thank you so much for joining us now. Uh, first, let me talk about the power sector, You know, one that uh, both of us track. Uh, how are valuations looking currently and which are your top picks in this particular space? Hi Vivek, uh, good afternoon and thanks for having me on your show. Uh, so before we get down to the valuations of power stocks, some backdrop in terms of macro. When we talk to the companies across the sector, we found that the power demand is real, but the supply is elusive. And that is the reason why government will take frantic steps to boost up supply measures across the, across the segment. That includes generation, transmission, distribution, and there is acute shortage all across. So there are, uh, you know, companies are beefing up significant amount of capex across the chain, uh, and therefore we continue to like the sector. Uh, you know, the regulated utilities continue to be our top picks. Torrent and CSE, where uh, the earnings are more skewed toward distribution, we continue to like them the most, and to that extent, the call on the sector remains quite unchanged. Okay, quite unchanged and continues to be positive. Harshpradhan, I wanted to understand the ongoing renewable versus thermal debate and if tomorrow uh, 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 the result are as the exit polls are suggesting, there will be a big push on renewables. According to you, which is more return generating for shareholders, companies which are focusing more on renewables as a part of their portfolio or the traditional thermal power? Well, I think investors are agnostic whether it is a coal power or renewable power. Uh, what they are looking for is any project which earns rate of return, which is much more than my, uh, you know, opportunity cost. And there are quite a few companies within the sector who, despite having presence in the renewable side, are able to generate healthy returns. For example, Torrent, uh, they have been scaling up the, the renewable capacity quite significantly, and yet the returns are quite handsome. And that is what the investors actually look for. Uh, that it doesn't matter whether it is a gas-based power plant or a renewable or coal, uh, they are quite mindful in terms of rate of return. But yes, I think relative to the coal, the growth opportunity on the renewable side is significantly higher 
And to that extent, uh, we'll weigh our options as to who can balance out the growth return ratios and cash flows. Okay. So, you know, one other big theme, you know, that investors have been talking about, Harshwagan, is the fact that it's the return of the CAPEX as far as PAR is concerned. Now, you've spoken about PAR utilities themselves. Uh, uh, do you have a call as far as, you know, the supply chain is concerned, especially in terms of capital goods companies, any component makers? Uh, do you have a view on that space? Vivek, while I personally don't cover uh, the cap goods and the ancillary sector, but as a house, we are extremely positive. Uh, I think the supply chain shortages are quite real. And when we spoke to power grid, uh, you know, top brass, uh, I think one of the key constraints for, uh, you know, the capacity addition is going to be the shortages across the chain, particularly transformers, conductors, and, you know, switch gears, etc. So to that extent, I think if there is, uh, if there are companies who are able to put up capacities and meet this demand, they are going to be in the sweetest of sweet spot. And the valuation themselves kind of, you know, reflect if some stocks are trading in near triple digit PE, uh, that in a way tells you as to how the earnings, strong earnings growth outlook is for the next considerable period in time. Okay, from power, let's switch to oil and gas now, uh, Harshwardhan, because there are big moves in oil and gas space as well today. Um, do you think it's a one-time thing that we're seeing most of the PSU rally? Are they just continuing with that? Or do you think there are actual fundamentals which will continue this rally through the course of the year and you continue to be positive on the space? So today we have actually released a, a detailed note on the sector, uh, which basically says worries are gone, game is on. And we are not even relating to the outcome of the elections because we are more concerned on the broader macro and uh, which is very healthy and very supportive. We think that the oil price will remain benign, cracks will be favorable, and domestic consumption will be fairly strong. And to that extent, with strong political mandate, uh, if, if you were to believe the exit poll, will basically tilt the pricing power in favor of the industry. And in that case, there is a significant scope for the earnings upgrade across the sector. And therefore, we don't think this is just a one-time pop. I think, for example, if the OMC earnings can uh, surprise you by, say, 20-25%, the valuations are extremely cheap even now. And to that extent, we see value across OMCs as, as well as the upstream sector. We continue to prefer overweight stance on these, uh, these names. Harshwadhan, you know, you spoke about OMCs, you know, maybe if we could uh, delve a little deeper. Now that, uh, you know, the election verdict is uh, largely behind us, uh, do you think that uh, once again, you know, you will see prices go higher as far as fuel pumps are concerned? And uh, where do you see marketing margins trend from here on? And uh, could you give us the pecking order that you have, especially in terms of OMCs? Sure. I'll take the last one first because that's the easiest one. <laughs> so, BPCL is our top pick followed by HP and IOC, uh, because we always prefer balanced portfolio. Uh, as far as price increases are concerned, I think uh, I will not monitor them on a weekly or a daily or a monthly basis. What I will watch out for is can the companies over a period in time pass on increase in the input cost to end consumer. It could be in a form of, you know, bunching up of price increases or basically taking hit in a quarter and so on and so forth. And that is most visible in terms of, you know, the uh, quarterly margins, which they will actually disclose. But yes, I think if there is a strong political mandate, the pricing power will definitely tilt in favor of these companies. And that is the reason why we like them the most. Okay, all right. And they've been big outperformers last year, this year itself. They're up anywhere between 30 to 60 percent. Harshwadhan, I wanted your take on Gale. Uh, one is LNG prices are lower. Uh, that is usually positive for Gale. The other thing, and you spoke about it in your report as well, is a possibility of national gas under GST. Of course, that won't come in the budget. That would be the GST council meet outcome. But do you really think there is a possibility? Because it has been ongoing for a long time. Uh, is there more chatter around that? In my opinion, there is a very high chance that uh, if not in first 100 days, but surely in the next 12 months, natural gas may be included under the ambit of GST. And that serves purpose of both industry as well as the government to fast track, uh, you know, transition towards green or clean economy. Today, while I'm consuming natural gas, I don't get input credit, whereas some of the unclean fuels do get. 
and to that extent there is no level playing field so as and when gst is basically imposed in natural gas or natural gas is included in gst there will be a level playing field and in a way consumers will be rewarded for consuming natural gas it will give a long way in terms of you know improving the gas penetration in india so to that extent gale will be a primary beneficiary of it because the transportation volumes will go up the trading volumes will go up and to that extent the valuation multiples are quite reasonable at this juncture thank you so much uh, harshvardhan you know for joining us today and giving us a sense of both the past space you know the oil and gas space uh, and a whole host of other stocks as well but that's all the time we have on this edition of midcap radar your stocks when we return <laughs>